SPIE presents the Advancing the Laser series, honoring 50 years of laser achievements. The kind of things that, you know, that I worked on over the years is, you know, I put a tremendous effort into, into developing these very high power lasers for fusion experiments and for nuclear weapon simulation experiments, nuclear weapon physics simulation experiments. And uh, that consumed a, you know, a very good portion of, of my professional life. And with the, uh, with the building of the NIF laser and its dedication recently, we will finally have a laser big enough to find out if these ideas that we've been working on for the last 30 years are real or not. And so I just, you know, hope to see that, that, that they can actually ignite one of those pellets before I die, because I spent my entire professional career building the base to the point where we could do the experiments we're about to do. I also worked very heavily on laser isotope separation, as you know. Livermore worked, uh, did a tremendous amount of work on uranium and plutonium isotope separation with lasers and built some of the most spectacular tunable laser facilities that are on the face, high power tunable laser facilities on the face of the earth. And that had to do with copper vapor lasers and dye lasers and, you know, high power devices and, and you know, multiple frequencies that excited the atoms and so forth. And so the spectroscopy of all of that and the technology of all of that and the theory of all of that was, was really exciting. In the DOD, we had worked on a whole variety of high-power lasers, gas dynamic lasers, chemical lasers, all these sort of things. They were always gaseous, and everybody believed that that was, uh, you know, the way to do it. But, you know, a number of us at Livermore sat down and wrote a paper where we essentially analyzed it from one end to the other. You know, what you could do, what would you do about thermal stresses, what would you do about, you know, optical aberrations, all these kinds of things. How would you do the heat transport and so forth? And we wrote a report and we published a paper. And I guess it made DARPA, then ARPA, angry. And so they gave our paper to two or three of their consultants and said, you know, we want you to do a research project pointing, why this, pointing out why this isn't true. And they went to work on it and both published a report saying, no, they got it right. That's probably really possible. And that started a whole series of, of developments at Livermore and, and in DOD organizations as to, you know, how to build moderate sized lasers, 10 kilowatts, 100 kilowatts, few hundred kilowatts. Uh, out of, out of solid state materials, whether they be glass or YAG or, you know, crystalline materials or so forth. That was a lot of fun. That was, you know, that was thinking that, you know, you know, thinking in a very divergent way. I mean, today you look back at that and you say, well, that's obvious. Well, back then, all the high power lasers all of us worked on were gases, okay? It wasn't obvious back then, and it was a lot of fun. And, you know, today, you know, some of that laser, some of the high average power laser technology, even out of the early kinds of glasses we used, is used to shot peen turbine blades in the big jet engines on commercial aircrafts so that they get, you know, many, many more times the lifetime before cracks start in the turbine blades. And, you know, the, the heavily curved wing sections where they go, um, where they meet the fuselage, basically, uh, you know, under the surface of the wing, uh, are, being, are being formed in shape and, 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 and stress compressed by thousands of laser pulses from these average power solid state lasers today. So that when you get on, you know, one of these big aircraft with these Rolls-Royce engines, it's the solid state, average power solid state laser technology we developed at Livermore uh, that's holding those turbine blades together for you. So that was a lot of fun too. I mean, 
you know, every time I go into a store and notice the laser scanner that reads the barcode, you know, it just for a small instant, you know, takes me back to, you know, before that. And it's just amazing to me that some of the uses of lasers uh, have become so commonplace we don't even realize they're lasers anymore. I mean, that's really, really interesting to me. And, and the people using them don't even know they're lasers. Uh, it's really very interesting. It's something you really ought to do if it is something that you can't imagine yourself doing anything else for the rest of your life. I mean, you know, to me, you know, I've had a lab in my basement since I was six or seven, okay? I could never imagine myself doing anything but doing science. And even though I've, you know, you know, retired from doing it for a living, I still do it here at my home. And if that's the way you feel about these things, this is the place to be. Don't worry about, don't worry about money. Don't worry about anything else. Just go for it if it's something you love. And if it's just going to be a job, don't do it. Because the rest of us are out there doing it 75 hours a week and we're passionate about it and you're not going to be able to compete. This country can still do things. Yeah. And it can still do things on a grand scale. And it can still do things that will make a difference.